Welcome to January's Secret Writers Showcase. We've got four amazing writers for you again this month. We're gonna, we're gonna sail through lands of self-love when you are enough. The miners strikes, sex in hotel rooms, Doctor Who, bit of looking after your nails. There is um, bittersweet stuff and there is humorous stuff and there is everything in between. I hope you enjoy. I'd like to welcome our first poet. It's Hilary Walker. Hi, I'm Hilary Walker and I live in Up Holland. I write poetry and in normal times I like to read my poems at various open mic nights such as Write Out Loud at the Old Courts in Wigan and various venues in the surrounding area. For Secret Writers, I'm going to be reading four poems written during the pandemic and the first one is called Human Touch. I work as a funeral celebrant and was inspired to write this poem after I'd conducted the first funeral where it wasn't possible to shake hands with a grieving family anymore, which was extremely sad and unfortunately still is the case. Um, the poem won a competition by um, Building Bridges in Pendle and the prize was to turn the poem into a song which has just been released by Manchester singer-songwriter Emma Mould and is available to listen to on YouTube. It's also called Human Touch. So this is the poem Human Touch. The first human language is touch. Instinctive, automatic, second nature. Touch comes before sight, before speech. Skin on skin begins each individual journey. In life, in death, in times of great despair, touch is there. We reach out, we grasp hold, sustained, soothed by human contact. We respond to those in need, hand on hand, heeding their pain. But when touch declares war, when touch becomes the enemy, when touch brings the biggest global threat the world has known, our lives are turned around, thrown upside down, postponed, cancelled indefinitely. We retreat and seek a different kind of empathy with our fellow man, find new ways to care, to just be there virtually communicating a means of healing, technically alleviating anxious feelings of intense sorrow, heart on heart, until tomorrow, when the world will reopen and invite us back to living, when the sun will shine and mankind will be forgiving, when we will appreciate all we ever had and all we ever needed to survive when tears dry and smiles grow, and the power of human touch is restored in all its glory, skin on skin, hand on hand, heart on heart, the first human language is touch. Thanks. So my second poem reflects on another big story from 2020, and this relates to the campaign for Black Lives Matter, and this is called White Silence. When George Floyd was murdered and cried, I can't breathe, it wasn't your fault. You didn't kneel on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. You are a good person. You were horrified. You empathized with his community deeply. But if you don't speak out, if you don't enunciate, if you don't find your voice, no matter your inability to articulate the right words, then you may be to blame next time. When Breonna Taylor was shot repeatedly as she was sleeping, it wasn't your fault. You didn't force entry into her apartment and unlawfully end her life. You are an open-minded individual anti-racist, multicultural, you felt her pain and injustice. But if you don't speak out, 
if you don't declare, if you don't offer a point of view, no matter how uneducated you may be on the subject, then you become part of the problem. When Ahmed Arbery was killed while he was out jogging, it wasn't your fault. You didn't shoot an unarmed man because he looked like a burglar. You are without prejudice, a tolerant human being. You couldn't believe this could happen in today's world. But if you don't speak out, if you don't proclaim, if you don't express yourself on the issue, no matter how uncomfortable you feel, then your silence will speak louder than your words. Thanks. Um, and so moving on, my next poem is quite personal and it is a little bit dark. It's, it tells the story of the death of a close family member who died when I was a young teenager and it's called Escape 1970. Inside the straitjacket, she is constrained. Last days before death, a lonely loss of freedom when needed most. I imagine her emotions, tied up, held down, crushed, panic spilling into every corner of her sterile camisole. Inside the straitjacket, there are moments of clarity, a hidden strength fight for recognition in a damaged brain, her precious mind soaring above forgotten reality. I imagine her frustration, silent screams, senseless words, curtailed breathing, a slight petite figure bound in canvas chains. Inside the straitjacket, does she fool herself? Does she dream her shackles are crafted from clean white muslin, silken handcuffs with delicate bindings caressing her tired skin? I imagine her courage, constant in the darkness. I imitate, emulate, hold myself still with crossed arms and false fears. It's not the same. Inside the straitjacket, she whispers a final prayer for release. A lifetime's regret surrendering to liberation. Last words unrecorded. Lost inside fragmented memories of loved ones. Buried beneath the passage of time. Thank you. And finally, um, you might be glad to know my last piece is a little bit lighter. It's also about the pandemic and it's for those of us who've been missing our beauty treatments in lockdown, especially appointments to have our nails done. So this is called Casualty of Our Time. One by one, they fell, like brave soldiers in combat zone. For months, I cherished their growth, their beauty, regularly strengthening each one with care. Their colour was luminous, deep magenta, vibrant and striking, manicured in uniform, a glossy dance of alignment, sparkling symmetry completed a professional finish, top coat polished, the perfect set. Some fell unexpectedly, others just knew it was their time and laid down their arms. Lockdown and my fingernails are a battlefield. Crimson crushed, dead shellac, the latest victim, a casualty of our time. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your talent with us, Hilary. And um, that was just wonderful, it made me cry. Um, and we're gonna move on from poetry now to a script come story. Um, written about the minor strikes. Hello, Susan Rigby. Hello, 
and uh, I'd like to introduce our next writer who is Susan Rigby. So you might recognise Susan from the first, the very first Secret Writer Showcase, but she only got to do a very small piece. So I've invited her back and she's doing a story that we turned into a script. Um, so what is the title of this piece? Hello, the title of it is uh, Strike. It's about the man who's striking in 1984. Oh. And I performed this piece at Sunshine Writers and Wigan Old Courts. Very good. And who will you be playing when we read this out? Well, I'll be the narrator and I'll be playing Ron, uh, Mildred's wife, husband. <laughs> okay, and I'll be playing Mildred, won't I, who's the wife? Yeah. And Jack, yeah. And Ron's friend. All right, yeah. let's begin then. It was 4 a.m. and Ron Williams sat round the kitchen table, eating his soggy toast and not speaking a word to his wife, Mildred. Mildred was staring out of the kitchen window into the backyard, sipping a mug of hot tea and blowing the steam to cool down. Are you on the picket line today, Ron? Yeah, I am. And I will be every day until we succeed in our fight to keep our pits. I have to meet Jack near the old bridge in five minutes, so I better get my skates on. He gave her a peck on the cheek, grabbed his jacket and went out the front door. Mildred stepped back from the front door and walked into the living room. Looking through the window, she caught a glimpse of him as he ran down the cobbled street. Ron had worked down the pit since he was 17. He had changed since the strike, not as romantic as when they were first married. He had become introverted, not speaking only about the picket lines, and now they will not beat us. Mildred was worried. Worried. Jack and Ron joined the other miners. And scub, 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 scub. The words ricochet out the mouths of the many angry strikers to the pitmen who are venturing over the picket line. The riot police were lined up like tin soldiers, ready to be knocked down. They were guarding pit gates so the non-strikers could get through. It's going to be a long day. It's early morning and already the police are moving in. Ron wanted to strike like all the other miners. They had to fight to keep the pits open. It's their way of life and there was no other jobs around here. He wanted a better life for Mildred because she gave up her training to become a nurse in London to be with him. His mind wandered back to the days when he was caught in her and they would meet up in the park and chase each other around the fields. Mildred, tall with long black flowing hair and her spindly legs showing off in a miniskirt. Now, what did he have to offer? Striking, not much money coming in, receiving food parcels from his parents. Mildred, working in the chipper, smelling like last night chip fat when she comes home. Lately, he noticed her running upstairs to the bathroom and throwing up in the toilet. She complained it was the smell of the old potatoes they used. His daydreaming was interrupted when there was a big roar like a football crowd. What's going on? It's the flying pickets from Yorkshire. They've come to join us. Come on, Ron, let's move up the line and greet them. There were about 10 of them and they were wearing white shirts and black trousers with NUM badges stuck on their shirt sleeves. Ron was a six foot muscular man with broad shoulders and stained black coal dust around his eyes. Jack, who was younger, looked up to Ron like an older brother. They had been friends for years since he started down the pit. He was single and liked to have a good time in the pubs. Mildred had gone to work and was putting on her fat splash stain pinna and started to serve customers. The same people every day wanting chips without fish because of the strike could not afford anything else. The owner of the chip shop had lowered her prices to accommodate the miners' families. In this community, the women would gather together and help each other in any way which possible. Some even joining their husbands on the picket line. It was a long day for Mildred, running to the toilet and back with sickness. The owner, Mrs Price, sent her home because she couldn't lose business. There was always someone who would offer to help for a free bag of chips. Mildred was walking slowly to her house down the road and she saw a young lad involved in a fight with two bigger lads. They shouted over to them and told them to stop fighting. 
They gave her a mouthful of obscenities, but that did not stop her to go over and try to defuse the situation. The younger lad was around 10 years old and was clearly upset with a black eye. Why are you two picking on this young lad? Shouted to them. Didn't you, didn't you know his dad is a scab and doesn't strike along with our dads? They shouted back. It doesn't mean you have to hurt him. It's not his fault. He doesn't deserve that beating. Mildred was furious that it had come to this because of the strike. Families against each other inciting violence within their kids. This surely is not the way. The lad ran off laughing and shouting, scabs behind them. Mildred put her hand on the young boy's shoulders and asked if he was okay. He said yes, and before she had the chance to help him, he ran off in the opposite direction. She reached her home and lay down on the settee with her feet up. I'm thinking she should tell Ron tonight about the pregnancy. She was smiling, thinking about her baby. At least something good may come out of this mess. But subconsciously, she worried about the longevity of the strike and what the outcome would be. Ron and Jack had finishing, finished picketing for the day, so they said goodbyes to the other miners who had come to relieve them on the line. They were walking back to the bridge when suddenly a man in his 60s came running past them with blood pouring from his face. Then four policemen were chasing him, shouting, Get back here, you scumbag. Jack, what shall we do? Ron said. What do you think? Let's join him. They both caught up with a man and each took an arm and ran with him. The older man tripped up and fell and passed out. The police caught up with them and started to hit Jack with a truncheon on his head. Leave him alone, he's only a lad, Ron shouted. A scuffle ensued between the police and Ron, all four of them rolling on the ground, hitting out at each other. Jack managed to get up off the ground, grabbed one of the policemen's arms and punched him in the face. The policeman was too quick for Jack. One heavy blow from this heavy-built irate bobbit and Jack fell to the floor once more. Ron was like in a china shop. He plunged into this bobbit and was fighting with him, but to no avail. Ron was knocked out too, and all three men left the dead on the road. The police ran off laughing and did not look back. Meanwhile, Mildred was wondering where Ron was. He should have been home by now, as it was getting late. She thought of meeting him and telling him the good news. She put on her grey gabardine mac and went out to look for him. Walking over the hill towards the mine on a dark country lane, she saw what looked like a heap of rubbish piled up. As she walked closer, she gasped in horror. The two men were huddled together, arms around each other, bleeding coming from both her head, arms and legs. She screamed out and reached out her hand to comfort the men. They were mourning and Mildred tried to clean the blood away. It was Ron and Jack. She managed to lift up Ron's hat, head and speak to him. Ron, it's Mildred. I will go and get help. She cried through her tears. Mildred ran and ran until she reached the picket line, shouting out to Ron's dad, who was there supporting the miners. Can you come quick? Ron and Jack are lying on the ground near the bridge. They have been beaten. Her voice echoed through the night as she shouted to them. It was getting dark and luckily she was seen and the men came running, leaving the picket line. The police had their backs to them, but Mildred, shouting, there were around five policemen running after them. Mildred shouted to them to stop, but they swung out to her and she fell on the ground. Mildred woke up to find herself in a hospital bed. She had fainted whilst the police ran past her. Overlooking her was Ron with a black eye, broken arm and on crutches. Hello, love, he said quietly. How proud I am of your courage today. I know I have not been the easiest man to live with, but it is all for community and to keep the pits open. The baby is okay too. That is all that matters. So you know about the baby. I was coming to meet you with the news, Mildred whispered. Tears running down her face. I have decided to go and live with my parents for a while until the baby is born at least. I don't think I can cope with all the worry 
about you not coming home and I get news that you're dead, I am not as strong as all the other wives. If that is what you want, Mildred, you do it. But think about this. We all have a fight on our hands. We cannot let them locked in government rulers and our beliefs. We are fighting for our baby so he or she can have a home and a secure life. That fellow who was with us, unfortunately, had a heart attack and died. Goodbye, Mildred. He gave her a peck on the cheek and left. He walked out of the hospital room and shouted behind him, Hope to see you tomorrow at home. Oh, hope to see you at home tomorrow. And that's it. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Susan, and for letting me be one of the characters in it. I quite enjoyed going scab, scab, scabs. And it reminded me of performing the Cotton and Coal script at the old courts where people got to perform all different poems and stories. So I hope you enjoyed it at home as well. Uh, next up, we've got another poet. It is the wonderful Catherine West McGrath. I've been following her on Instagram where she does some lovely little film poems and um, you know with a voice recorded over images so check that out uh, enjoy hello my name's Catherine West McGrath and last year I published two paperback collections of poetry the first one is called there is a person poems and lyrics to heal the brokenhearted and it's available on Amazon um, and I'm going to read four poems from that collection they all have a common theme, the four poems, which is love. The first one is about romantic love. Then we have self-love. The third one is about commitment love. And the fourth one is dedicated to St. Valentine himself. So, love poem. You're my safe space. You're my happy place. I see in your face beauty, love and grace. You're my now and here, you're my all that's dear. Kindest voice to hear, you're my free from fear. You're the sun's warm rays, you're my special days. When it's all a haze, you're my favourite gaze. You're your shoulders broad, you're a hug adored. You're my love outpoured, where my heart is stored. You're a soothing balm, when I sense alarm. You're a sea of calm, refuge from all harm. You're my deepest stare, you're my depth of care, want my life to share, you're my everywhere. You're your smiling eyes, you're your laugh surprise, when you hear my cries, you're my paradise. You're a soft warm bed, you're my cradled head, and my favourite med is all that you've said. You're my brightest light, you're my sweetest night, when it's all alright, you're in line of sight. You're my favourite drink, you're my cheeks go pink at the kitchen sink, you're my nice to think. You're my sacred sound, you're my deep profound, where my heart is found, you're my homeward bound. You're my hand to hold, you're my shield from cold, when I'm very old, you're my story told. And the next one we have is about self-love and it's called An Exquisite Age. An exquisite age is when you finally understand you are the one you've been searching for. You are your better half. You are the one that will complete you. You are the message, story and song you need to hear. You have a treasure within you. You are not your emotions. You are your best friend. You are accepted just as you are. You are a masterpiece and a work in progress. You have talents which may be deeply hidden. You are missed when you are not around. You are enough. Your voice deserves to be heard. You can learn a lesson. You can make mistakes. You can change your mind. You can turn around. You can take a new path. You are the sun and the moon and the stars. Your blood and bones contain the cosmos. You hold galaxies in your teardrops. You are a way for the universe to know itself. Your DNA looks like magnificent stained glass. You are at one with nature. You hold all knowledge inside of you. You are exquisite. The third one is called Love Manifesto. And it's really about um, commitment love and real healthy love. 
It's not the who, but what we'll be. It's not the look or game. It's what we'll bring, not what we'll take, not who we'll choose to blame. It's not the one, twin flame, soulmate. We'll not believe their lies. It's our intention to create that will define our ties. With commitment, we'll need to work to understand our own. Those reasons why we make a choice, not to curse the other one. We leave at times so we can seek adventures we can share. To return back with tales and truths, we'll find our passions there. We'll not demand something we won't expect within ourselves. We look inside to be aware, like seeking books on shelves. We won't require each to complete an emptiness we feel. Our completeness is ours to find, not others we can steal. We'll make the time to nurture, care, so each one will be heard. We'll not neglect our precious love, our tiny fleeting bird. We'll take an interest in the goals, the ones which fuel our drives. And love the passion that we know gives meaning to our lives. We'll show compassion every day. We'll make sure we are kind, communicating where we can the stories in our mind. We'll be two equal spirits whole. We'll complement the other. We'll create space to fuel desire, attentive but not smother. We'll let each live their life in full to learn and stretch and grow and thank each other for the gift, the love we've come to know. We'll learn to trust, we'll make it so and sign our love manifesto. And the final one I'm going to do for you is about St. Valentine. And it's actually based on a true story. I found myself in Dublin one year uh, I was working so I was by myself and it was the 14th of February and I discovered that St Valentine's remains are actually in a Dublin church so I went along to the mass that they have at nine o'clock on St Valentine's Day and sure enough there were the remains of St Valentine in a tiny box and at the end of the mass everybody went down as Catholics do to venerate people's remains and everybody went and kissed this box that held the remains of saint valentine and uh, this is the poem that i wrote about it on valentine's i went to church on a busy dublin street to find remains of a roman saint i thought i ought to meet his few remains were locked inside that small reliquary I felt his spirit yearn to leave, no more a prisoner be. I kissed the chest that with him in had reached the Irish shore, and I imagined you right there, so thought of you some more. On leaving, I felt winter sun, faint blue broke through the cloud. I found myself in Temple Bar among its younger crowd. Each one of you had visited, the Dublin streets had tread, either to live or passing through this then your common thread. Some conversations I recall, I listened then more than, but sure we walked its many streets, no long-term love your plan. And each new meeting pushed me on to find who I should be, till in that Dublin street I knew my one true love was me. Retracing steps I did return, went back to find the place, a pilgrimage to Valentine, his holy sacred space. To tell him I had learnt my task, compassion was our key. And with that key I turned the lock to set the poor saint free. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Catherine. If you're interested in hearing more of Catherine's work, I'll put the link into the comments for a YouTube podcast she made with a German journalist and also she's featured in the book The Language of Lockdown. And our final writer of this evening is the wonderful Paul Turton, who I met when he was travelling up um, all around the country to work and he came to the Open Mic Nights in Wigan. Hello there, my name's Paul Turton and Louise has kindly asked me to come along and do some of my stuff. Now, some of you may recognise me from the old courts when I used to come about 18 months ago, 
whilst I was working away from home and stopping in Earlham and Skelmersdale. I wrote most of my poetry while sitting in a hotel room, totally bored as a way of stopping me going bonkers. You'll also notice as well, I don't have a local accent. I'm actually from Nottingham and back and living working there too. But I do miss coming to the old courts, which is always a friendly, welcoming atmosphere. And I hope after this pandemic's over, I'll be able to pop along and see you soon. Anyway, for this video, I'm going to give you four poems, all of which were written whilst I was working away. Now, this first one is based on a particular experience I had stopping in one of the hotels just outside of Skem. I'm stopping in a hotel room. You're just staying for the night. I just want to get to bed and screw my eyes up tight. And then the noises begin. This is the story of my plight. The couple upstairs are having sex. I can hear their bed start to squeak. I mean, they must be having lots of fun because I can hear the lady shriek. The couple upstairs are having sex. I can feel my room start to shake. All I want to do is sleep, but they're keeping me awake. The couple upstairs are having sex. And I don't doubt the lady's piety because she spent the last half hour calling continually upon a deity. The couple upstairs are still having sex. He must be asking questions, I guess. I can't hear what he says to her, but the answer is always... Yes! 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 The couple upstairs are still having sex. I mean, they've been at it now for an hour. The least of bed stops squeaking because they're at it in the shower. You know that couple who are having sex? I saw them at breakfast time and I said, based on your performance last night, out of ten, I'd score you nine. Now, there's only one question that needs to be asked and I don't want to make it sound like a whine. But why do other people's sexual activities last much longer than mine? True story of that. Now, the next poem is about death and it's called When I Die, open brackets, notes of my wife, close brackets. And as we've been stuck indoors due to this horrible pandemic, I'm going to hand over to this handsome chap so you can see a bit of the outdoors for once. We all have to die someday and one day I'll draw my last breath. You know, there's so many euphemisms out there for that thing that we call death. There's pushing up the daisies or being brown bread. Sleeping with the fishes, or like the ex-parrot, he's dead. Dead as a doornail, gone to the happy hunting ground. Popping my clogs, either way I'm no longer around. Death finally comes to us all and one day that bony bastard will beckon. Not the staircase to heaven for me, but the other direction I reckon. But don't worry too much about that thing we don't like to discuss. Here I lay out the rules when I pass here, for that day I'm hit by a bus. Rule one. My organs can be used. Take my eyes, my lungs, my kidneys, but remember, my heart belongs to you. Aww. Two, lay me out in a white suit like Marty from Random Hot Curtis East. I can't guarantee I'll come back as a ghost, but if I do, I want to look good. Three, don't worry too much about the coffin, for buggers only burn it or bury it anyway. Just chuck plenty of books in with me. You're a long time dead and I want something to do in the afterlife. Four, funeral music. Carry me in solemnly to Ra Ra Rasputin by Boney M. I want to disappear behind the curtain with tear stained cheeks to heaven for the weather, hell for the company by the streets. And finally, you can all exit dancing to play that funky music white boy by Wild Cherry. Five, I would like a mysterious woman in black and just too short a skirt, standing at the back, sobbing into a white silk handkerchief. Six, I have a version of my way recorded on my room on a CD. Play it at my wake and give everybody nightmares forever. Seven, invite everybody I know, friends, relatives, even those who don't like me. Though we may be enemies in life, we can be friends in death. Eight, don't let the best man from our wedding read my eulogy. At the wedding, he was far too interested in chatting your sister up. I won't do it right this time. Nine, to my wife. Life and relationships have their ups and downs. Think about me kindly when you talk about me. Remember the good times and please forgive me my shortcomings. And finally, 10 to my kids. Please once in a while turn off your game systems and your tablets, look up from your phones and gaze at heaven. I won't be there, 
but it'd be nice if you thought I was. Life is short and our tenure on this earth is fleeting. But don't miss me too much for one day soon we'll all be meeting. Be it a creak on the stairs or a presence you cannot see, you can bet your bottom dollar that presence will be me. <laughs> for those of you who know me, you'll know I'm a bit of a geek and a massive fan of the TV series Doctor Who. Now, I wrote this one following some major changes they made to the show, which left a large percentage of the fan base up in arms. See, I admit it, I'm not ashamed. I've been a Doctor Who fan all my life. See, I know lots of people just like me, my son, even the wife. From Hartnell, Troughton and Pertwee, and not forgetting Tom Baker, even the casting of Wet Bed Davison wasn't a deal breaker. From Baker, Colin and Ben McCoy, and that movie with Paul McGann, yeah, I know it was a little bit crap, but it didn't stop me being a fan. And then finally, after years of waiting the 2005 series reboot, with well-written plots and good production values, its rating success seemed absolute. Eccleston, Tennant, Smith and Capaldi, even the war doctor John Hurt, every one the perfect doctor, the future was looking assert. But now naysayers are predicting its demise with unbelievable keenness all because the new doctor you see doesn't come equipped with a penis the supreme dalek can take over the world why just because they can all because there's no one around because the doctor's no longer a man see no one seemed to mind the other year when the master regenerated into missy you know apart from a few homophobic jerks who all got a little bit pissy now, I know that Daleks and Cybermen are anything but stupid and thick. They were defeated by cunning and guile, and not because the Doctor had a dick. See, I don't care if a Doc's man or woman, or even if they're straight or gay. All that matters is they defeat the baddies, and ultimately save the day. So well done to Jodie Whittaker, the now 13th Doc, proving you can save the day, even though you don't have a cock. For my final offering, I want to take you back to the 1980s when this was all the rage. Remember Henry Cooper in the adverts? Splash it all over, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is my homage to those times and it's called The Great Smell of Brute. But first of all, let's make a few lighting adjustments. Picture me, school disco 1983 and the room resounds to the strains of wham. And there I stand drenched in brute, no longer a boy, but not yet a man. I mean, just by the way, how can the person who wrote wham, bam, I am a man also write careless whisper? I guess George Michael can. And there I am, age 16, wearing my dad's best suit, hot and sticky and sweating, the smell drowned out by the brute. You know, thinking back to the adverts, though, I wasn't a Kevin Keegan fan. It was definitely a Henry Cooper for me, a real man's man. But then dancing like Shaking Stevens, like he'd just dropped some acid, lurching around the dance floor, limbs all floppy and flaccid. But I'm not there for Shaky. I'm just there for the last dance. And, you know, maybe some snogging with Mary Jones, given half a chance. Wanton stirrings and sexual awakenings, lustful desires with a longing and an aching. The time approaches. The last dance is near. It's time to find her and overcome my fear. And now, ladies and gentlemen, take your partners for The Last Dance. In a haze of Charlie, she drifts over to me and asks me to dance. Well, that's something I didn't foresee. Youthful awkwardness. Where do my hands go? Am I dancing too fast? Am I dancing too slow? Am I holding her too close? Am I holding her too far? Can she smell my fear? Just how the hell do you undo a bra? To John Lennon's woman, I lean in to kiss. Clumsy and too keen, I manage to miss. Second time better, our lips finally meet. I draw her in tighter and feel her body heat. Oh, they were warm and moist with the sweetness of fruit, and I hope she didn't mind the overpowering smell of my brute. But just as the kiss started, the last dance is over, and as we drift apart, I'm as happy as a pig in clover. But the next day at school, I tried to catch her eye and she looked and looked away and I could feel something die. That briefest moment of magic was quickly all gone as I saw her holding hands with her new boyfriend, John. 
School ended that week. It was over, I knew. But what the future held next? I really hadn't a clue. But of future adventures and tumbles, I will remain mute. But I'll never forget that great smell of brute. Thank you, everybody. See you soon. Take care. If you've enjoyed watching the Old Courts live and you'd like to make a donation to support the work we do, please head over to www.theoldcourts.com forward slash donate. This year has been incredibly difficult for most arts organisations and we're no different. But with a huge effort and support from you and from our funders, we've managed to secure our organisation and the jobs of every staff member. We've also provided 343 artists with paid work for the Old Courts Live. And our volunteers have delivered over 700 food parcels and made 600 calls to isolated local residents. But the battle isn't over yet. We're currently closed to the public with zero income and we don't know how long this closure is going to last. If you can help by making a donation, then you're helping to secure your art centre. We're hoping to